Hello everybody, welcome to the very first Modern Railways podcast. Now then, I must say it's a surprise to me that I, when I first started reading the magazine back in the 60s, it was a surprise to me I ended up writing it, and now an even bigger surprise, I end up starting this podcast about the magazine. But these are strange times. What's the point, you might be asking? Well, now that not many of you are walking past station bookstalls or supermarket book stands or whatever, uh, you don't get the opportunity to pick the mag up and have a quick flick through. So this is an electronic version of the quick flick through on a bookstall. And obviously, we hope you like what's coming. First off, let's hear from our editor, Philip Sherratt. Philip, give us a little overview. Thanks, Ian. The May issue of Modern Railways, uh, clearly we can't ignore coronavirus. It's um, had a massive impact on all aspects of our lives. And the railways are no exception to that. And there's been some fantastic work done across the railway industry to uh, respond to it, to uh, keep uh, the workforce safe, to keep key worker timetables moving so that key key workers can get around um, and to reduce services in in a phased way. And by and large, that's worked really well. So we're reporting on all the flat that's gone on, the impact on the passenger operators, on the freight sector, on network rail, There were changes were made to the Easter Bank Holiday Engineering Works and they obviously had to implement social distancing uh, when they're carrying out any works, but they need to keep the railway maintained and open and running. So that's some of the news about that. We've also got a report from our Europe editor, Keith Fender, who explains some of the different work that's been carried out across continents of Europe and um, how different operators responded. And there's some quite interesting parallels in there. There's one situation where a bank of infrastructure work that's planned over quite a long period had actually been carried out um, due, while the reduced service has been operating. So um, it shows you that coronavirus does, um, for all the, the very obvious difficulties and challenges it brings, it, um, it has its opportunities as well. Uh, beyond that, um, Roger has done some analysis about coronavirus, which he'll talk about separately. But I do want to emphasise that the magazine isn't just about coronavirus. And if you want a break from it, you will find that within Modern Railways. Ian's written uh, something in his panel column, which he'll speak about separately. But there are also um, there's still news going on from within the industry that we're reporting on about projects and about new rolling stock on tests and so on. And uh, there's also some features uh, within the magazine. These, in, uh, Among those are a, I went to visit Bombardier's factory in Derby before the lockdown measures were implemented. So we have a report from that and an interview I did with the UK President Matt Byrne. And there's some quite interesting detail in there about the proposed takeover by Alstom, about Bombardier's strategy in regards to its Aventra platform and uh, future traction technologies such as battery power as well. And we have our annual report on the May timetable changes as well. That's May timetable change. It won't happen in May, that's almost certain, but it's likely to be implemented at some point later in the year. So we've got our roundup of what's changing, and that's always an interesting um, summary and analysis to read. So there's plenty within Modern Railways for you. Uh, Just to say, finally, that the magazine is still printed uh, and it is still available. If you're a subscriber, you should be getting your copy through the post. Uh, but it is still out in the shops where these are open. But if not, you can order it online. Um, all the details are on the Key Publishing website. So thanks very much, and I'll hand back over to Ian. OK, thank you, Philip. Now, we've met the new boss there. What about the old boss? Well, the old boss, James Abbott, a little bit about him in this month. Uh, he's got a few words to say to us now, so we'll just cut over to James if I should say, by the way, with James, that if anybody ever knew exactly the right time to retire, James is that man. James. Hello, my name is James Abbott, former editor of Modern Railways, now consultant editor of the magazine. My role here is to welcome my successor, Phil Sherrod, to the editor's chair. My final day as editor of the magazine was Tuesday the 17th of March and that on that day not only did we finish the April issue of the magazine, my last issue, but we also took the decision that the Modern Railways 4th Friday Club conferences and events that were due to take place in the spring and summer would be shunted into the autumn. 
was just three days before the pubs were shut and just a week before the total lockdown came in with all of us asked to stay at home wherever possible. So a strange time for Phil to be taking over and we can already see that uh, when we come out of this crisis that uh, things are going to be radically different. Many firms have discovered that they don't need such uh, large head office operations and many employees can continue to work, work from home on a more permanent basis. And we can also expect that uh, long distance travel will be affected as people have found that uh, screen meetings can replace face-to-face -face meetings. Lots of questions still to be answered. How long will social distancing persist and what effect will that have on the capacity of trains if uh, previous levels of crowding are no longer acceptable? So with all these questions hanging in the air, there will there has never been such a need for information about our industry. So I think that Phil's taking over at an interesting time and I wish him all the best in his role, new role. Thank you. All right, thank you, James. Nice bookshelves. Now, next person up, Roger Ford. You're probably thinking, oh, come on, Roger, give us some more on traffic management systems. Well, no, he has got some more interesting stuff, very interesting stuff for us this month. And uh, Roger's going to tell us about it now. Roger, what have you got? As you might expect, the um, lead item in informed sources this month is the impact of the coronavirus crisis on the railway. Uh, when the lockdown was announced, the government introduced what it called emergency measures agreements, which replaced the franchise agreements and direct awards with the train operating companies. Under these EMA, the government takes all the revenue coming in and in return pays all the train operating companies' costs plus a small management fee, a very small management fee. What I've done is analyse each tox costs and revenues and worked out what it costs the government uh, to keep them going. My sums suggest that if the crisis lasts for, say, six months, uh, the cost, the extra cost, is going to be about four billion, which is roughly the total support for the railway in normal times. I've also looked at the uh, possible uh, way out, how fast revenue and traffic will come back when the lockdown is lifted. Uh, there are precedents for this, although obviously nothing on such a, a major scale in terms of shutdown. For example, there was the uh, crisis, the recession in, uh, 20, in uh, 1990, and then of course there was the Hatfield uh, closure uh, after the derailment. I've looked at this in terms of how fast traffic could come back for the three major businesses, Intercity, Network Southeast, and Regional. There's some good news in the, in the column this month. The rollout of re-signalling of the East Coast Main Line uh, south of Peterborough with the European train control system is going ahead. Uh, Network Rail has published, has started the consultation on the um, process in the, under which it has to agree with the train operating companies what's going to happen, uh, possible disruption and so on. And with that documentation came a new schedule for how the rollout is going to take place. It will start with the uh, installation of ETCS on the line from Finsbury Park down into Moorgate, which is just operating by one set of trains, which are equipped with ETCS. And it's also necessary uh, because it's the most urgent replacement. Less good news comes from the Department of Transport, which has published a consultation document on decarbonisation of transport. This is uh, essentially, as you might imagine, very lukewarm on electrification. It's back to grayling mode. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, we're going to have to fight even harder to get the rolling programme of electrification. There's a quote from Elvis Presley on this in the column. Tinwatch, the way where I analyse the performance of the new trains in terms of reliability every month, uh, has some added value uh, in this issue. Uh, what I've done is see how well the new trains are improving reliability. This is what is known as the bathtub curve, where reli as reliability improves, you get a bathtub sh shaped curve of, of reliability. And in theory, uh, if you're sitting at the non-tap end, it goes down fairly quickly and then it levels out along the bottom of the bath. 
What I've done is look back over six months, uh, produce two column and uh, two extra columns to the standard column of train reliability, and shown the difference in reliability over that over that period. Um, I've shown that in miles rather than percentage figures because uh, if you're not very good at reliability, 100% uh, improvement on not very good is still not very good. I've also uh, followed up on last month's column where I talked about uh, the problems facing uh, LNER with its mixed fleet of Azumas. It's got uh, five car bi modes, nine car bi modes, five car electrics, nine car electrics, and these do create problems in terms of uh, scheduling and so on. Uh, LNER very kindly followed this up with me and what they have provided is a schedule, pre-COVID I have to uh, emphasize, of how they're going to introduce these fleets, the uh, availability figures and so on, leading up to the timetable in 2021. I think you'll find this quite interesting. So that's all from the column uh, from, for this month, but I hope you enjoy it and uh, we'll be back next month. Meanwhile, stay safe. Thank you, Roger. What a remarkable amount of stuff he gets into his column. So, oh, not forgetting, of course, my very own Pan Up column. Now, this month, we have the superannuated Anoraks back out on tour. A while ago, we did cross Southern Country, so this time we're going cross Northern Country, logical enough. Now, I, you're probably thinking, Ah, yes, that's just an excuse to go off riding on local old trains with his mates. Yes, that's exactly what it is. However, we always find out a few things. And uh, there's a lot of things in the article that we discovered. And uh, the main thing has to be, whenever you travel about the north, is the massive damage inflicted on all of the train services by the congestion of the Castlefield Corridor. Now, I know regular readers have read a lot about the Castlefield Corridor, and there is a network rail report on it. Now, I've read that report and I've been about three times to the Castlefield Corridor to watch what's going on and talk to some of the staff. And it seems to me we're missing a lot of tricks here. Now, the Network Rail recommendation is, well, we may have spent £100 million, but the recommendation is to cut the train service. And since every train seems to be packed, certainly in the peak, I don't think that's a very good option. And it is a bit embarrassing to spend a lot of money only to end up with an even worse service. So... We could make an effort, and I believe there's quite a lot we could do. And so I've separated out a bit from the superannuated Anorax trip and uh, done a little section on the Castlefield Corridor itself and the things that we could do to make it better. It's incredibly frustrating to stand there and just look at all of these things going past. And everything is so slow. It's almost like a Great Western branch line with milk churns on the platform made of 14xx jugging in. It's just painfully slow, and I know we could do a lot more, but it does mean that management have to absorb and control a bit of risk. But I think that's their job. Anyway, see what you think. If you read the article, indeed, you can write to us and tell us what you thought afterwards, if you like. Still, there's obviously lots of other stuff in the magazine, your regular columnists, loads of news items and so on. Um, but that's the main features covered just for now. And uh, we hope you enjoyed the very first Modern Railways podcast. We hope to be back next month about the same time and tell you what's in the next forthcoming edition. But until then, stay safe, whether you're out there keeping the railways going or just sitting at home watching, whatever. Look after yourselves and we'll see you next time. Bye all.